Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier, and thanks again for stopping by. Um, my macro thoughts start with uh, Turkey, where the central bank struck at midnight, um, and I'll come to the details of that midnight strike uh, a little bit later. Um, I'm going to put up a photograph I took early morning. You can't see the moon, it was a tiny sliver. Uh, must have been about 6.15 uh, out, uh, outside Nairobi, just a little distance. And uh, it really is one of the most beautiful pleasures about being back in Africa, at the sunrises and the sunsets. They're beautiful all over the world, but I find them particularly beautiful. And early in the morning, there's some fuchsia color that is there momentarily, and it's such a pleasure. I can feel the heat closing in, feel them out there making their moves. So starts Naked Lunch, the touchstone novel by William S. Burroughs. And I don't know if you've ever read that. I did. And uh, coming from a rather cosseted uh, upbringing to read that book, and I'll put up a photograph of him, and probably give you an indication of what he was like. But um, quite extraordinary, an extraordinary fellow. My political reflections, I'm, I looked through President Obama's State of the Union address and I pulled out these comments. A man took the bus home from the graveyard, shift, bone tired, but dreaming big dreams for his son. Talking about oil, more oil produced, more oil produced at home than we buy from the rest of the world. The first time that's happened in nearly 20 years and that's a big geopolitical uh, game changer. Um, business leaders around the world have declared that China is no longer the world's number one place to invest. America is. That's why I believe this can be a breakthrough year for America, he said. After five years of grit and determined effort, the U.S. is better positioned for the 21st century than any other nation on earth. Of course, I don't believe in that uh, idea of um, Exclusive, you know, exclusion. I think, uh, but nevertheless, that's part of the American rhetoric. Let's make this a year of action. That's what most Americans want for all of us in this chamber to focus on their lives, their hopes, their aspirations, and what I believe unites the people of this nation, regardless of race or region or party, young or old, rich or poor is the simple, profound belief in opportunity for all, the notion that if you work hard and take responsibility, you can get ahead in America. And then talking about women, as usual, our first lady sets a good example, Michelle's, well, yep, Michelle's, let's move, he said. Opportunity is who we are, and the defining project of our generation must be to restore that promise. Listen, China and Europe aren't standing on the sidelines, and neither, neither should we. We know that the nation goes all in on innovation today, will own the global economy tomorrow. Indeed, that's true. This is an age America cannot surrender. The all the, all the above energy strategy I announced a few years ago is working, and today America is closer to energy independence than we have been in decades. He's raising the mineral, federal minimum wage to $10.10, saying it's easy to remember, 10.10. The fact is danger remains. While we put Al-Qaeda's core leadership on a path to defeat, the threat has evolved as Al-Qaeda affiliates and other extremists take root in different parts of the world, in Yemen, Somalia, Iraq, Mali. We've been working with partners to disrupt and disable these networks. And Syria will support the opposition that rejects the agenda of terrorist networks. We must fight the battles that need to be fought, not those that terrorists prefer from us. Indeed, good point. Large-scale deployments that drain our strength and may ultimately feed extremism. And that's what asymmetric warfare is all about. With the Afghan war ending, this needs to be the year Congress lifts the remaining restrictions on detainee transfers and we close the prison at Guantanamo Bay. They really have to close it this year. It's the boil on their bona fides. Because we counter terrorism not just through intelligence and military action, but by remaining true to our constitutional ideals and setting an example for the rest of the world. 
We are clear-eyed about Iran's support for terrorist organizations like Hezbollah, which threaten our allies, and we're clear about the mistrust between our nations, mistrust that cannot be wished away. But these negotiations don't rely on trust. Any long-term deal we agree to must be based on verifiable action. That convinces us and the international community that Iran is not building a nuclear bomb. If John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan could negotiate with the Soviet Union, then surely a strong and confident America can negotiate with less powerful adversaries today. The sanctions that we put in place help to make this opportunity possible, but let me be clear, and this is an important point is made, if this Congress sends me a new sanctions bill now, that threatens to derail these talks, I will veto it. So that, so he is, I think, you know, it's quite calibrated. He has to deliver. The Iranians are delivering. And uh, it was quite sex, quite choreographed as well, I think. For the sake of our national security, we must give diplomacy a chance to succeed. If Iran's leaders do seize the chance, and we'll know soon enough, then Iran could take an important step to rejoin the community of nations. And we will have resolved one of the leading security challenges of our time without the risks of war. But if we work together, if we summon what is best in us, the way Corey summoned what is best in him, with our feet planted firmly in today, but our eyes cast towards tomorrow, I know it's within our reach. Believe it, he said. I bet you his mum told him to believe it. Mine did. I'll put up a photograph. <coughs> but essentially, I thought it was pretty punchy. I think it's lost a little bit of momentum and terribly cerebral. But nevertheless, I think he's, he's sketched out um, a, quite a reasonable position. And I'm pleased he's facing down Congress over Iran. And increasingly, the, you know, there are a number of people I speak to whose opinion is that it's not entirely improbable that um, the U.S. Uh, throws Saudi Arabia overboard in order for a new security relationship with Iran. I know it's far-fetched, but it is a view that's gaining hold. Malaysia Navy chief denies Chinese incursion. Malay Malaysia's Navy chief has denied a report that three Chinese Navy ships patrolled an area claimed by the Southeast Asian country, saying the Chinese exercise took place hundreds of miles to the north in international waters. Zinua reported that an amphibious landing craft and two destroyers patrolled the James Shoal on Sunday, 50 miles off the coast of Malaysia's Sarawak, and held a ceremony in which they swore to safeguard Chinese sovereignty. The reported activity at the southernmost tip of Beijing sweeping claims over the South China Sea appeared to be the latest sign of its territorial assertiveness that has boosted tensions with claimants such as the Philippines and Vietnam. Royal Malaysian Navy Chief Abdul Aziz Jafar, in comments published by the New Straits Times on Wednesday, said the Chinese exercise involving its newly commissioned aircraft carrier and a submarine took place 1,000 nautical miles away from Malaysia's 200 nautical mile economic exclusion zone. He said Malaysia and the U.S. have been informed of the exercise beforehand. There has been no act of provocation on the part of the Chinese or threat to our sovereignty as they are conducting their exercise in international waters, the pro-government newspaper quoted him as saying. China's aircraft carrier, the Liaoning, completed its first sea trials and returned to port on January 1st, according to Xinhua, an apparent contradiction with the Malaysian Navy chief's reported comments. So in conclusion, I think the Malaysians are seeking a less adversarial position vis-a-vis -vis China than others, Shinzo Abe, of course, being the one who's seeking the most up front and in your face confrontation. The Central African Republic, uh, the UN Security Council has approved an EU force. And we spoke about the, that yesterday, the insertion of hard power and by all and sundry all around the African continent. Currency markets, Euro 136.56, dollar index 80.66, yen 103.28. And uh, remember, it touched 101.77 briefly, and it's been backing up since then. And, uh, Safe haven bid uh, dissipated a little bit post what Turkey did. Swiss franc 0.9002. The pound 165.76. Uh, the Aussie 0.8807. You can see small recovery in the Aussie. 
uh, rupee 62.135, South Korean won stronger at 1069.64, and South Korea interestingly reported that the annual current account surplus widened to a record and factory output beat estimates. The real is at 242.64. Egyptian pound 696.04, the Rand 1091.69, good rally, and you can see the higher beta currencies have had a rebound, and that's all because of Turkey. Um, and the Turkish lira jumped 4.1% to 2.1648, adding to a two-day 3.7% advance. It touched a record low of 239 on Jan 27, and I'm still to come to that. The yen has advanced 3.1% this year, and that's the highest, get biggest gain in January. The dollar is 0.8% higher, and the euro 0.1%. The Aussie has fallen 06 I'll put up a three-month chart of the dollar index. The Fed concludes its two-day policy meeting late on Wednesday, and is all but certain to reduce its bond purchases for a second time to $65 billion per month from $75 billion. This meeting is the last one for the Fed Chairman, Ben Bernanke. Euro dollar, I'll put up a three month chart of that. That's last 136.56. I have a 133.80 stop. And I think, you know, the European balance sheet is sort of structurally more sound than the US and Japan. And therefore, that merits a higher euro. Dollar yen, I'll put up a three month chart, 103.28. And the safe haven demand ebbs a little post Turkey's midnight action. Commodity markets, gold at 1252.52. I'll put up a one year chart. I think it's very overcooked. We've had a third day of declines. This is the longest losing run since December, since the period to December 19. Um, obviously, we had a very, very uh, volatile start in emerging markets. That gave a big bid to gold, but I think that's going to start to ease off. Crude oil, $97.33. I do not buy this rally. Oil fell 40 cents this morning, but uh, climbed sharply a dollar 69 cents uh, yesterday uh, to 97.41, which was the highest close since December 31. But I think the place to start selling is above 100, and it might just get there. The Turkish lira currency surged after the bank raised the one week repo rate 10% uh, from 4.5%, so a 550 basis point hike there. Um, and investors are being told to treat that rate as the new benchmark. Um, uh, comments on a Bloomberg report, the central bank is taking a pretty big step towards regaining some of its lost credibility. It's put the emphasis squarely on preserving market stability and tackling inflation, and at the same time it's faced down the government. That's an interesting point as well. Raised the overnight lending rate to 12%, from 7 and 3 quarters percent um, and overnight borrowing rate to 8% from 3.5%. The lira, of course, jumped sharply, 2.9%. Still the second worst performing major currency in the world after Argentina's peso. Of course, Erdogan's been railing against the interest rate lobby, blaming it for a series of blows to his government. Um, and the benchmark index reached an 18-month low yesterday and has dropped 24% in dollar terms uh, since uh, December the 17th, and that's the most among global benchmarks over that period. And I wrote about this on the 27th of January when I said mark when markets are in this kind of mood, they're like sharks which have smelt blood in the water, and policymakers who only a short time ago were being fated simply have their legs cut from underneath them, and I think that's exactly what's happened to Erdogan. On that note, I'll put up a photograph of the shark by Damien Hurst. Barty Airtel headed for its biggest gain in more than a month in Mumbai trading after reporting mobile data revenue more than doubled in the third quarter. And I think that is the holy grail for operators worldwide. And I'm seeing the same kind of thing happening in Safaricom's results. Company reduced net debt to $9.3 billion. Uh, earnings before EBITDA um, uh, rose 22.8%. And they're talking about it being boosted by data and non-voice revenue growth. And I think that's the new high growth curve for these types of businesses. Coming to Sub-Saharan Africa, it's headline um, that I found on BD Live, which is a South African website. You know, war tops talks as African leaders gather in Ethiopia for summit. War in the Central African Republic and South Sudan are key priorities. Ethiopian Foreign Minister Tedros Adhanom said ahead of the two-day AU meeting. 
that opens on Thursday. Um, of course, they'll probably talk about the ICC as they tend to. Um, and uh, uh, Tedros saying the fact that these humanitarian tragedies are unfolding in the two countries at a time when we're talking about an African Renaissance must be painful to all of us. Unless we find an urgent solution, the situation in these two countries will have serious implications for peace and security in the region and indeed the whole continent, he added. And then someone else talking about this, if all the talk we've had it for well over a decade about an African standby force, the fact is that when emergencies come up, it starts all over again, there is no standby force. And that's the key, I think, into that whole the lack of having that capacity, others will place a capacity in there, and then essentially that capacity is beholden to the fellow putting it in. <laughs> um, uh, heads of state will gather at the gleaming Chinese built AU headquarters on Thursday and Friday, and that's of course where uh, Shinzo Abe delivered his rather subtle speech as well. Um, somebody else saying the whole Africa rising thing was a bit of a swing too far away from Africa as a continent that's continuing crisis. And, you know, Africa can be schizophrenic, and it's, it's exemplified by the next article I'm going to talk about. You have to be kind of bipolar at times, appreciating the risks, but also, and simultaneously, appreciating the relentlessness of the Africa's convergence with the rest of the world, and that's what I... Um, there's a lot of beta around it, but nevertheless, that thing is going on under its own steam and momentum. Wall Street Journal, and uh, I had to be cheeky and copy and paste the article, which they don't like people doing, but I take the view that at least more people might hopefully read it. Uh, African investors join Scramble for Africa. This is a report talking about how private equity firms run by African investors are eyeing assets in energy and manufacturing services across the continent. African investors have the risk appetite and local knowledge that might offer an edge in scooping up deals. No one can develop Africa better than Africans, and I believe foreign investors would be happier to have local investors there too. Tony Elumelu, chairman of the Lagos based private equity fund Hairs Holdings, um, he signed a billion dollar deal with General Electric. They've had a, got an interview with Ashish Thakka, um, who says that uh, he's the founder of the Mara Group and he's in business with Bob Diamond. Um, thing, you know, in 2008, many of the foreign investors rushed to the exit. This led to a huge shift in government attitudes towards local investors. They know we're from this place and we're not going anywhere. But still, the biggest deals were done by Chinese Indian investors in the energy sector. That's the Mozambique transactions around gas. Um, and uh, I remain bullish, but I think, you know, it's quite right that it's good that. We're seeing African entrepreneurs play a bigger role. South Sudan rebel leader should face treason charge, says the Justice Minister. Um, Minister Paulino Wanawila Unango cushioned the blow by saying seven other political figures arrested after the violence erupted would be released, partly meeting one of the rebels' demands at the negotiations. Um, uh, Machar is now in hiding, dismissed the allegation saying Kier taken advantage of an outbreak of fighting to round up political rivals. Um, uh, the Justice Minister saying anybody who intends to change a constitutional government or to suspend the constitution or abrogate the constitution by force commits treason. Um, and uh, then talking about the political detainees, I think they're going to go to another country it seems. And my problem with the whole situation is I cannot see a singular victory or singular victor you know, by one side or the other. I think, you know, if you do achieve that, you're just going to be blown away in years of asymmetric warfare. And therefore, until I think both sides stop seeing it in such a binary way, I win, you lose, uh, then the situation remains fragile and prone to breakdown. And I, I don't think I've seen a roadmap out of that. I'll put up a photograph uh, of a poster of President Keir on the, on the uh, front door of the VIP room at the Juba Airport. Um, 1,520 days ago, and I'll put up another photograph of Vice President Rick Machar and Joseph Kony. The South African oil shares negative 1.07%. This year, obviously, the, the backlash from the taper hit the rand and has also hit the stock market now. Dollar versus rand, well, it's traded back down below 11. Last time I checked, it's 10.9181. I'll put up a one month chart. Shorts essentially covering because of the Turkey uh, um, 
the techie bounce that we saw in EM currencies. Um, I, for one, think we'll see 12 in 2014. I'm going to put up a photograph via AP of the ousted Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi standing inside in a soundproof cage fitted with a microphone controlled by the judge. While the defendants this time enclosed in a soundproof cage fitted with a microphone controlled by the judge, Morsi had limited opportunity to question the authority of the court. At one point he yelled at the judge, Who are you? while his fellow accused chanted illegitimate in reference to the validity of the court proceedings. I'll put up a three-month chart of the Egyptian pound that's still below seven, so found some support around this area of 696.14. The Egyptian stock market's been on a flyer this year. It's up 8.7% now in uh, 2014. This is a fresh 44-month high, and we're not all, far off an all-time high in point of fact. And I wrote about this when, on the 20th over the weekend when I said, you know, if the equity markets had a vote in Egypt, Army Chief Abdul al-Sisi would actually get one of those impossible-to-believe votes of 99.8%. The Nigerian Orsha down 0.34% this year. Ghana Stock Exchange up 3.95% this year and at a record high as well. The oil tanker Kerala, which was under a Liberian flag and working for Sun and Gold, which went missing on January the 18th while waiting for authorization to anchor in Luanda, was located on Sunday in Nigeria, said the spokesman of the Angolan Navy. However, in another report I found in the Atlantic, this is what it said, Angola is trying to cover up how a loaded vessel was taken in an area under its protection, and there will now have to be an investigation by U.S. authorities and Interpol put up a photograph of the Kerala. I found this headline of Fox News Africa. What Fox News Africa is, I'm not sure, but the headline reads, Witness 356 told the court that he was bribed by USAID agents who promised him safe haven if he helps them. I find it a bit incredible, frankly, that headline. Kenyan Energy Bonanza fans violence in arid northern region. This is a report by Bloomberg. It's very interesting, very detailed, and giving some hard data to back up that point. Boru Sora stood in front of a pile of tree trunks and rocks in the middle of the road. As he explained why he and other residents of his village in northern Kenya are blocking a key trade route to neighboring Ethiopia. 25-year-old leader of a group of Barana youth says he's determined to ensure his kinsmen derive some benefit from the development of infrastructure in the area, such as Africa's biggest wind power plant, even if it means breaking the law. Clashes between Barana herders and the crop-growing Burji community killed at least 56 people last year, and more than double the number in 2012. Very interesting article. It's on Rich Wrap-Ups. If you get a chance, have a look at it because uh, there's plenty of resources there and I'm not convinced that it's being managed properly by any party. Car in general uh, reported full year profit after tax accelerated 18.47%. Strong results. It's biggest gainer today. Uh, before it opened today, it was after these results, it was trading on a P of less than 4. And um, the uh, they're basically creating um, additional shares, 7 million additional shares, and then a bonus issue of one for every five held. Um, I did that interview with Beatrice uh, on CNBC about Art Cafe, Dorman's, uh, Tiger Brands, Rafiki Miller's, TBL Mirror Fund. If you get a chance, that link is on Rich Wrap Ups as well. Um, I wrote over the weekend about this mineral export license holdup could hit planned Eurobond, and I said then, you know, let me mark your car down in Kuala, base titanium, is all it's set to export its first batch of mineral sands. In fact, mineral sand exports will overtake coffee as Kenya's fourth most valuable export. Ship has been booked, companies are waiting an export license. Base titanium invested more than $300 million in Kuala at the port and at the port on the basis of an investment agreement signed with the government of Kenya. Subsequent to the signing of the investor agreement, the ministers, via Gazette notice, introduced a higher royalty regime. If the Eurobond market, and the Eurobond market is a killer shark, smells that we are discarding our legally binding agreements, that we play fast and loose with our signature, then this Eurobond is not going anywhere, and is dead in the water. The blowback from a fumbled Eurobond is just unconscionable. I'll put up a photograph I took of from my insight in 
Bali 28 days ago. SR is saying it's going to finalize a sale of eight, about $100 million stake uh, by March. They've been saying that for eternity. The Kenya shilling just below 86, uh, performing very well in a very volatile environment. Nairobi All Share up 4.91% this year. NSE 20 up 2.71% this year and above 5,000 since the 8th of January. I'm going to put up a photograph of a male lion um, after being shot with a tranquilizer dart that I found in the Guardian. And I'll put up a photograph I took of a lioness trying to get a better view uh, 1,072 days ago. Coming to the Nairobi Securities Exchange, it eased 0.72% of the all share yesterday, plus 4.91%. Uh, has corrected 0.836% over the last two sessions. Probably going to correct again for the third session in, the, in a row. BOC up 51.2% this year. Extraordinary and parabolic rally. Closed higher for the 12th consecutive session, which is a record winning streak. Limuru T up 25% in 2014. Closed at a record yesterday. Britam up 31.023%. Closed at a record yesterday as well. Um, a lot of commentary yesterday about the bidding war. In my view, the bidding war for Air Bipinga has repriced the agricultural sector, plenty to play for still. Safaricom having hit a record high of 12.45 on Friday, light profit taking coming in. Um, and then KCB put out an investor note, which I've already spoken about in yesterday's podcast, which has encouraged the bulls as well. Once again, thank you for stopping by. I do appreciate it.